interview and to meet you um, and to share this information about behavior-based interviewing. When I began my training business, 20 Hats, about seven years ago, this was, I believe it was the first training that I offered. And that's because um, before I began my business, I was a volunteer manager for many years uh, at a court-appointed special advocates or CASA program where we recruited and trained volunteers to advocate for abused and neglected children. And this particular presentation comes directly out of my experience as the person who used to recruit and train volunteers for our CASA program. We found this interviewing process a game changer. I still do find it a game changer, and I've, I've done this training now many, many times over the years, and, and I hope you do too. Um, the goal ultimately is to help you develop a volunteer core that is um, that is really is loyal, you know, that really increases your volunteer retention, and also that you have a volunteer core that is really a good fit for the volunteer roles that you offer, so that you can develop, so that you can deliver much more powerfully on your mission. So with that, let's get going. Let's get going if I can move my slides, that is. Uh, okay, technical, okay, so here's what we're going to cover. We're going to talk, I'll talk a little more about why I think behavior-based interviewing is so valuable. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the process for developing behavior-based questions. One reason I love giving this information and delivering this webinar is that unlike some webinars, which are, you know, sort of giving you facts and figures and things like that, I'm actually teaching you a step-by-step -step process that you can take and use in your program. So we'll be talking about that. I'll give you some interviewing pointers. So it's not just about creating the behavior-based questions. You know, there is obviously some art and skill to how you interview. And then um, I'm also going to give you some tips for turning away unqualified applicants, because that is never fun. OK. First, I'd like to start with a little exercise. So on your screen here, imagine that the people you see here on your screen are all of the individuals who have applied to your program for a certain volunteer role. And I'm going to ask you to guesstimate. With this process I'm about to teach you, that, as I've mentioned, leads to greater volunteer retention um, and volunteers who are a better fit for the role, how many of these individuals do you think will end up becoming actual volunteers? What percentage? 10%, 20%, 50%, whatever, go ahead and put that in the chat. And I will ask uh, Todd to take a look at um, the responses you give. I am saying 80%. Jessica, 10%. From her, Gonzalez. Melissa is saying 60%. Francisco, 40%. And Nancy, 50%. Marie is saying 75%. And Lori, also 75%. Seeing from Martha 70%, and Katie Lynn 50%. So it is all over the spectrum. Okay, okay, all right. Well, here's the big reveal. With this process, you may only end up bringing into your program 30 to 35% of the volunteers who apply. Yikes. I know, yikes. Um, it's, it's good news, though, trust me, it really is. This is what we found at my CASA program, Fairfax CASA in Fairfax, Virginia that we were we ultimately once we started to use this method we brought in about thirty to thirty five percent of the people who applied to become volunteers at that program. And if that sounds scary to you, the good news is that um, what it means is that we're doing our screening on the front end and we had much less turnover on the back end. Um, so that everything so that ultimately uh, because we were bringing in only, you know, sort of the most qualified volunteers, we had much less turnover and much less time and effort um, devoted to managing our volunteers or managing difficult volunteers or whatever the issue might be on the back end. Now, that said, you may find when you use this method that you are still screening in a larger percentage than 30 to 35%. So I also don't want to alarm you for that reason. I'm, I want to be clear that this is what we found in our program, and I know that because I track those numbers very carefully. You may find something a little different. 
However, the ultimate goal is to bring in the volunteers who are the best fit and to weed out the volunteers who are unlikely to be successful in your program. So, as I said, we found this to be a very successful method at Fairfax CASA. Um, but I want to explain a little bit to you about why we ended up using this method. Uh, when I came on board at Fairfax CASA to recruit and train volunteers, um, we had some problems. Uh, we were finding that, excuse me just a sec, I need to drink some water. I get so excited telling the story, I get a little nervous. <laughs> we actually had some problems. We thought we were good at screening and interviewing, but actually we had a huge turnover over rates with our volunteers. Uh, sorry, I'm going to drink a little more water. A little more it's like it's cut. Yeah, wash it down, exactly. And so we were lucky because we had a board member at Fairfax Casa who was head of human resources for our county. And so she actually delegated one of her managers to, treat, to train us in this method of behavior-based interviewing to help us with our numbers. So here's what we were finding before we learned how to do behavior-based interviewing. In year one, the number of new volunteers that we brought in who never took a case was 21%. And the number of new volunteers dropping a case was 4%. So if you add that together, that means 25% or a full quarter of the volunteers that we brought into our program didn't work out. You know, that's a pretty huge number. And I don't know if you're familiar with CASA programs, but we have a mandate, at least at Fairfax CASA, to have a volunteer on every single case of abuse and neglect that came into the system. And this meant that we always had a waiting list of, of cases that needed a, a CASA volunteer, a waiting list of abused and neglected children who needed someone to advocate for them. So as far as our mission was concerned, this was a big problem. So, if you, so as I said, we received this training through Fairfax County from one of the managers in the county HR department on how to do behavior-based interviewing. We started to implement this process. We made a few other tweaks that I'll share as far as the uh, assessing applicants and so forth. And this is how, oh, oh by the way, before, before I show you the next slide, uh, volunteers assigned to cases we have 135 and children waiting 53. That was the waiting list I was telling you about. So two years later, after implementing this process, the number of new volunteers never taking a case was 2%. That was one person. And the number of new volunteers dropping their case was 2%, one person. So after two years, we had only two dropouts from our program. And here's how that translated as far as our mission. The number of volunteers assigned the cases went up to 157, and we had six children waiting to be assigned. So for our program, we received some pretty dramatic results from employing this interviewing process. And I noticed that there are a number of you online from hospital systems. I'm guessing you may have roles that are in some way similar to the cost of volunteer role in that you need um, volunteers with a variety of skills who make um, a pretty fixed commitment. Um, in our case, cost of volunteers must agree to stay on the case they are assigned until it's closed. Sometimes that can be two years or longer, so we're looking for a very special kind of person. And so this was obviously a huge game changer for us. Also, as far as retention goes, here are some more numbers. In year one, before we employed this process, the percentage of volunteers remaining five years or longer was 29%, which is, you know, not bad. Two years later, the percentage of volunteers remaining five years or longer was 48%, and we were really proud of that. So we were definitely bringing on board volunteers who were going to stay in the program. And as with any volunteer role, the longer your volunteers are in that role, obviously the more experienced they become and the better they become at serving on the mission. So that was a huge success for us. We considered that a huge win. So the, the basic concept behind behavior-based interviewing is very simple. It's just this, past behavior 
is the best indicator of future behavior or performance. In other words, in order to assess how someone is going to do in the future in the volunteer position that you are offering, you want to look for examples of how they how of their competency with the various skills you need in the past. Very simple concept. Um, it takes a little practice to get used to creating behavior-based questions, but once you do, then you are flying. And it's that is easy from there. Lisa, Marie has pointed out that they have also started using behavior-based interviewing, and it makes a big difference. And I noticed that uh -huh. they had 75% retention when you were answering that question earlier. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic, Marie. Yeah, Marie, I'd be interested in hearing more comments, you know, as you go along. Yeah, I think I'd meet her at some point if you at prefer. At the end of the presentation, yeah. yeah. I would love to hear some, you know, some other comments about the process. So that's the basic premise, but um, I want you to be the judge um, and, and see for yourself what it looks like to interview using a behavior-based method versus a more traditional method where you might be using hypothetical questions um, or lots of yes-nos, uh, which are actually okay, but, just, um, but still not behavior-based. Um, so Todd and I are going to go through a little exercise. So. Um, Todd, if you could yep. interview um, you, if you could interview me and give everyone the scoring sheet, the link for the scoring sheet. Um, all right, I'm going to interview you first, and then I'll give you everybody the link to the scoring sheet. Well, actually, give them the link first because I want them to be scoring as we go along. Yeah, that might take a second. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh, while Todd is looking for that, what he's looking for is a scoring sheet. It's a Google Doc. Um, and, you know, obviously you don't have time to print it out most likely, so just grab a piece of paper and, and use the scoring format to score the questions. Um, what we're going to do is Todd is going to interview me on two different competencies for um, a position as a tour guide at a historical, at a historical house. A tour guide. Yes, right. tour guide at a historic house who's going to interview me on two competencies. You will be able to see the, I believe they are reliability and, and customer service. Is that right, Todd? I'm not looking at the form right now. Uh, I am. I've got reliability and I've got some traditional, you know, the non-behavior based questions that I might ask regarding reliability and then I have the more behavior based. Exactly. So we're, we're going to do this in two rounds. In round one, Todd is going to interview me using more traditional kinds of interview questions. And you're going to score my responses. And here's how you're going to rate them. If you don't think I answered the question well, you score it as a one. If you think I sort of partially answered the question, that's a two. And if you think I really nailed it, that's a three. So round one is going to be traditional questions. So I'll put that in quotes, traditional. And round two, in round two, Todd's going to ask behavior-based questions, and then I want you to score me again, and then I want you to compare those scores and see how they're different. So, okay, let's get going. All right, Elisa, thank you so much for coming in to uh, the interview today. We so appreciate your time and oh, look no. at your resume. Um, and, you know, and we've been talking a little bit about the importance of reliability amongst our staff members. And mm -hmm. I have a question for you. Um, so this yes, assignment, sure. this assignment requires really good customer service skills, Elisa. So uh -huh. as an ambassador, how would you interact with visitors? Oh, well, I'm really good at interacting with visitors, you know, and I, I know. and so, I, yeah, yeah, I've, I, you know, I often interact with people, so I don't see that as, as being a problem. I would love to do that. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, so also on the subject of reliability, we'll need you to make a serious commitment, Lisa, and show up for every shift. Can you do that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. No problem. Okay, great. Fantastic. Okay. All right. So those that that was round one. Yes. With traditional questions. So round two would be with behavior based questions, right? Yeah. Okay. So cool. hopefully you have rated those questions and we will we'll get started again. Okay, so All right. round two. Round two. Also on reliability. Alyssa, thank you so much for coming in today. We just love having you here. And, you know, we love the smile and uh, you know, your resume just looks fantastic. Can you 
Tell me about a time you were responsible for providing customer service within a really busy environment. How did, how did you interact with the customers? Oh, well, you know, I used to be an event planner um, within a nonprofit. We did a lot of fundraising events. And, uh, you know, and I, I used to work with the sponsors who were like our customers. And so it was my job to make sure that the sponsors, um, you know, were always welcomed at the event, that they were well taken care of, you know, that they had easy access to the food and beverage tent, that they had all the tickets they need, that they had good seats, um, that any issues that came up, you know, I, I was sure to take care of them right away. Not just at the event, but but beforehand, as we were, you know, promoting them as sponsors, and and afterward as well, um, you know, and I and I did that for you know many years. So I, I've worked with a, a great many sponsors, and um, you know, sometimes you know people, um, you know, people had concerns or they had complaints, and it was my job to make sure that that their their issues were addressed. And obviously, uh, because they were sponsors, I, I had to do that in a very you know, a very polite and diplomatic manner and appreciative manner and so forth. So, um, yes, I've been in that situation many times. Awesome. And you sound like you handled it pretty well. In fact, that gave me, like, a really clear picture, actually, oh, of how you, would, how you would handle that. So um, another question for you? You ready? Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of the same. But t- tell me about a time when you met a requirement, even though it was, frankly, inconvenient for you to meet the requirement. What what happened? How did you deal with that? Oh, well, you know, before I applied for this volunteer role, I, I worked at a CASA volunteer advocating for abused and neglected oh, children. Oh, interesting. I did. And we were, we were, you know, one of our responsibilities on the case was whenever there's a hearing, we were uh, responsible for writing a report to the judge, um, laying out the facts of the case and making some recommendations. And that was in the best interest of the child. And, um, of course, um, you know, though there's a hard deadline for those court reports because they had to be turned in two weeks before the hearing. So they had enough time to be processed and read by the judge before the hearing. And I remember once I had a court report due when I was traveling. Um, and this was many years ago before, you know, we had easy access to devices and laptops, so um, I had to turn in my court report. I remember actually going to a Kinko's and logging on to a Kinko's. No way. Kinko's. You actually yeah, went okay. to the Kinko's. I went to awesome. Kinko's. And I logged on and I emailed my court report to my, my supervisor. Yeah, I do remember those days, okay, when Wi-Fi wasn't right. available on my phone. Right? <laughs> right, exactly. So you actually, and I, I turned in a few things that way. So that is, that's impressive to me that even though it was obviously terribly inconvenient, you knew you had a deadline, the court absolutely had to have your report, and you were willing to do whatever it took, even as a volunteer, to make sure that they got it. Well, you know, I, I took it pretty seriously, you know, this commitment to be a CASA volunteer, because, you know, you're dealing with abused children. You don't want to do anything that's going to, you know, affect, affect their, you know, their future. Exactly. So cool. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. So, interviewing around the same competencies, sort of customer service skills and reliability, two different kinds of questions. So go ahead and put in the chat um, who, how did, which round got rated higher, round one or round two? I didn't have Nancy indicate that she can't access Google Docs at her organization, so she can't participate. Ah, okay. Round two from Jessica, from Lori, round two for sure, from Marie, same thing. Okay. All right. Same from Patricia, Lori. It's great. Thank you for interacting with us so we can get some feedback here. Okay. And how come? And actually, you know, I wouldn't mind if, if someone unmuted and sort of explained what they saw as the difference between the two rounds. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and unmute those folks who have been responding here to the test. Okay. So Marie, okay. Lori, and um, Patricia, just a second. You'll probably see that you have been unmuted. Uh, so Marie, Lori, and Patricia, you are on now. So if any of you would like to relate, and Jessica. Okay. This, is, this is Marie. I, I would say that um, 
of course, in two, you got a lot more information, some sound examples that described, you know, the challenges that she faced in getting something accomplished. And rather than, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm good at it, but that doesn't tell you anything. Um, so, um, again, you know, if, if she, uh, you know, handled those situations as well as she did, and um, she's probably going to handle the situations you have in your uh, agency just as competently. Right, exactly, exactly. Then you get some very specific examples that hopefully translate to yeah, the Thank you, Maureen. That's perfect. Lori is actually raising her hand, and you're on mute, Lori. No, I mean, the first interview, the first round, we didn't get any information from the person. Just yeah. I mean, what is that, really? <laughs> if you come in to volunteer and you want to do this, then of course you're going to say yes. The questions. Of course, I can do this, but it doesn't right. really prove anything, you know. So the second round was just, you know, she obviously had experience and she could answer the questions, and you can tell by that that she would be qualified to volunteer with you. Exactly. exactly. Much better. Much better. Yeah. Okay, I would say as you were answering the second round of questions, I was, as the interviewer, I was painting a picture of you in that situation, literally in the Kinkos, right? You know, you know <laughs> grabbing whatever amounted to a laptop at the time, you know, and trying to get yeah. it into their network and broadcast, you know, I mean, it was important, right? Right, yeah, exactly. The kind of volunteers you want. You yeah. Know, somebody exactly. who's going to be reliable. I, I interview volunteers for the emergency department at Cedar sinai and I'm just so happy about the new program now for the geriatric program in the emergency department, and I've been calling on volunteers that have life experience to do that, because I get people of all ages starting at 21, and, you know, I need people who have some experience with taking care of older patients or older people in their family. Right, exactly, because it's a question of, of being able to meet the needs of the position, right? Right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. this is definitely excellent already. I can see that this is, <laughs> this is the way to go. Okay, good, good. And one more thing I'll answer. What differences, what other difference did you notice between the two interviews? I'll ask a leading question. Which interview was longer? The second one. The second one, exactly. And you will find that when you are uh, using a behavior-based method that your interviews are longer because your volunteers are giving you longer longer answers. Your applicants are giving you longer answers. So I bring that up just so that you factor that in as you're, you're figuring out how much time you need for interviews. This process tends to be a little bit longer because you're getting so much valuable information out of it. No, that's definitely true. When people have experience, they like to talk about their experience. <laughs> they do. They, they like do. to tell you how good they are and what right. they've done. Right, exactly. They're very proud of that. Right, and there's a reason why they apply. So before we move on, I would, I've unmuted Lori Albers um, because she had a comment in text. Lori, would you mind sharing that um, vocally, or do you want me to read it? You're in mute. Yeah, Lori, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, I just said that we use this type of interviewing since our volunteers all um, serve on advisory roles for our mm -hmm. hospital, and they have to talk about their lived experience, so we need to make sure they're comfortable talking about their lived experience. We also need to determine what their triggers might be so we don't put them in a situation that could cause more trauma. And then we need to also make sure while we're doing these interviews that they're right fit for us, so we can use an example of what we expect and then ask them questions based on that example and see what their answers are. Yeah, excellent, excellent. I'm glad you brought that up. This this method, uh, you can use it to screen for sort of hard skill competencies, um, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, word process, you know, computer skills, or um, or you can use it, but it's really, really great for, you know, sort of EQ, um, assessing someone's emotional intelligence, their emotional stability, their their ability to maintain boundaries, to not get triggered, as you say, and so forth. It's really, really useful for that. So I'm glad you brought that up. 
Well, and the thing that's so important from uh, that life experience that she's talking about for for hospitals and healthcare, just like it is for CASA, you know, you, mm-hmm. you get people who are traumatized in emergency yeah. rooms, just like you do with traumatized children, all right? And they're going to need, especially in our current circumstances, they're going to need, you know, somebody who can actually listen to them. And it can't be a 20-year-old kid who's listening to a COVID patient who may be taking among their last breaths, okay? Yeah. You know, it's just not going to work, all right? So, you know, it, it, that's really, really important. Anyway, I won't take any more time. Uh, okay. Was there anybody else who wants to comment? Please raise your hand or write it in the chat, please. Okay, no, we're good. Yeah. Okay. There will be other opportunities. All right, so let me move on. So here's the process for developing the behavior-based questions. First, you need to identify the competencies you need based on the volunteer position description. This may sound like a no-brainer, but I will tell you, back at Fairfax Casa, we had never done this. And we thought of ourselves as, you know, really smart, intuitive people. But when we came together to develop interview questions before learning this process, we did not pull out our volunteer position description. We just sort of thought off the top of our head about what we thought we needed to interview about. Um, so, but, but basing, basing your questions on the position description is absolutely step one. It may require, as it did for us, that you um, revise your volunteer position description. Um, and that's not a bad exercise either, to make sure that it's as accurate, it reflects as accurately as possible what you really need in the position. Step two is to list all of those competencies. What you will find more than likely is that you have a really long list of competencies that you need for the volunteer position. Um, And that's great, that is normal. Um, Then what you're going to need to do is pare down that list, prioritize down to the key competencies. And I don't have this on the slide, um, but really the question you're asking yourself at this point is, is this a competency that this volunteer needs to possess walking into the program? Or is this a competency that I can um, train them around once they're in the program? So that's sort of the, the question you need to ask. You need to ask yourself, you know, is this something I can coach them around later? Or, you know, is it a non-starter if they don't have this competency to begin with? Then you want to develop questions that assess for each key competency, and I'll show you how to do that. There is a specific way to do that. And then, of course, I know you're doing this already, you're assessing for those competencies throughout the screening process. So besides during the interviews, you're also assessing during any training that they complete and so forth. Okay. All right. So there are really only two typical phrasings for behavior-based questions. The goal is, as you see here on this slide, that questions should elicit specific examples of a skill. Just the way when Todd was interviewing me in round two, he was asking for specific examples. So behavior-based questions almost always begin one of two ways. Tell me about a time when or give me an example of a time when. Which you never want to do, never ever in a hypothetical. For example, here's a Kahasa question we used to do. What would you do if a parent refused to meet with you? What would? The word, the word would is something you want to avoid. Um, and you can put your answer in the chat here, but why do you think it's not good to ask hypotheticals? Why is that not a good idea? You raise your hand or write it into the text. So I think that it's because they really don't know because they haven't had that experience. Mm-hmm. They don't know. I, I think I see the chat answers sort of float onto my screen when they come. Yeah, sometimes you're getting them, and we have yeah, some yeah. issues with how to get them to somebody besides the host of our panelists. Um, Maria Howell is saying that they're just not based in reality. And mm-hmm. Karen Keating is saying, well, because you are just going to get the answer you want to hear. And not exactly. The that you need. Right. Exactly right. When you ask a hypothetical question, you are cueing the person you're interviewing about the answer you want to get. And so they're going to try and give it to you. 
that's not to say when you ask a behavior-based question that they still don't know what you're getting at. The challenge for the person who's being interviewed is that even if they know what kind of answer you want, they can only they can only share from their experience, um, and that's why it's so much more valuable. Um, I will I will uh, give you a heads up that when you are first learning this process, sometimes without even realizing it, you might shift into hypotheticals. So that's just something to be mindful of. Um, Okay, so let's practice identifying competencies. So, Todd, the other link that you see there is for this, this position here, which is this museum guide position. Yep, I need to wrap it in. Yeah, and so this is an actual position. I pulled it off the Internet for a museum guide for the Sinsbury Connecticut Historical Society. And so uh, go ahead and open that up on your screen. Uh, take a moment to read through it, and then you can go ahead and, and sort of list the competencies that you see in the chat. What kind of competencies are needed? And as I said, they can be hard skills um, or they can be soft skills, you know, like good interpersonal skills and so forth. Get all jeopardy. Presentation skills and organizational skills have come up from Jessica and Marie. Mm hmm Great. Great. What else do you get to see? Ability to work with a diverse population from Jessica. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good people skills from Her Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So, so you definitely get the idea. Public okay. speaking. Yes, public speaking. Yes, yes. Willing to learn information necessary for I can't see the entire. For the tours. For the tours. Yes, yes. Right. Willing to learn. Willing to pick up information. Right. And yeah, these are all exa excellent examples of competencies. Walking and standing for long periods of time. Yes, for this particular position, that's actually um, pretty important, isn't it, for, for the way it's written? Not so that yeah. unscheduled tours. Yeah, that's open to interpretation, isn't it? I guess maybe perhaps it, it means they want volunteers that are sort of on call that they can they can call at a moment's notice. Interesting that they are vague, right? I mean, we're sitting here wondering ourselves, right? Right, right. Yeah, well, I'm wondering if this uh, this position description might need a little bit of a re revision. Okay, so as I think about competencies, I am going to give you two competencies that. Um, I think just about every volunteer position needs to be screening for. One is reliability. You heard Todd interviewing me around reliability. Um, to me, that's almost an automatic competency that ends up in just about every behavior-based interview. Then coachability, as I said. You know, is this someone that if they, if they have potential, but they don't have all of the skills you need yet, is this somebody you can coach and bring along with you? So I give you those and um, you know, strongly encourage you, uh, as you develop behavior-based questions, to behave, develop questions around these two competencies. Okay, let's pause for questions here, and then we'll move on a little bit. Are there any questions at this point? Well, please raise your hand if you would like to speak verbally. I'm happy to unmute you. Okay, well, I'm going to move on. I know sometimes with time, the time delays on webinars, it takes a second for the chat questions to come in. I'm happy to answer them later. But let's go ahead and, and create an interview question. Um, well, I like uh, to uh, I sort of use this method to craft my behavior-based questions, uh, and I call it the sandwich method. In other words, you explain the context, 
And then you ask either tell me about a time or give me an example of a kind of behavior-based question. That's a behavior-based question right there in step number two. And then I follow up by saying, what was the situation and what did you do? I find that when you're interviewing someone, they often need an additional prompt, like asking what was the situation and what did you do, to get their thinking going about what a good example might be to share in the interview. So let's take, Todd, why don't you pick one of the competencies that uh, the group shared, and I'll come up with the first question, and then uh, I'll ask the group to come up with the second question. Good people skills. Good people skills. Okay. So explaining the context would be something like, you know, our, our tour guides, you know, give tours to, you know, a very diverse group of people. You know, as you know, when you're working with a large group, um, you know, you, you get a lot of personalities in there. You get talkers. You get people who are quiet. You get people who might be a bit argumentative. Um, tell me about a time when you had to um, give a presentation to a large and diverse group of people. What was the situation and what did you do? So that's an example of a behavior-based behavior -based question. So Todd, why don't you throw out another, another competency? Willing to learn information necessary. Okay. So, so as far as practice for all of you, let's skip step one, explaining the context, go ahead and in the chat formulate your behavior-based question about able to learn information. Learn. Willing, yeah, willingness to learn. Willingness to learn, able to learn, interest in learning. I'll give you some latitude there and how you, how, you know, how you're going about that question. But write the behavior-based question for, for, for willing or interest in learning. Or if you're struggling with that, um, raise your hand and we'll unmute and help you out. Exactly. Exactly. I like to say that at this point you could throw any competency at, at me and I could come up with a behavior-based question around it. <laughs> uh, because I've had a lot of practice. When you're first doing it, it takes a little longer. Lori Albers is saying, tell me about a time when you needed to learn a lot of information that might not have been of great interest to you. Oh. And Karen Keeney is saying, tell me about a time that you had to learn something that was difficult and you didn't really understand. Okay. And Marie Howell is saying, tell me about a time when you went out of your way to get more information about something of interest to you. And Lindsay is saying, tell me about a time that you had to prepare for something you had no experience with. What was the situation and what did you do? She kind of merged them. Okay, great. Those are all great examples. And what I love about those examples is that they also double up with a second competency. And each of those examples are also screening for something else. So, for example, tell me about a time when you went out of your way to get more information and you're sort of looking for someone who's a self-starter, right, self-directed. And that may be a competency that you need to screen for. Um, so, and sometimes, sometimes data-based questions do get at two things at once. Tell me about a time you had to learn something that was difficult and you didn't really understand. You know, that's someone who can, um, perhaps you're screening for persistence, or ability, the ability to overcome challenges. Um, let's see. Is there another one here? Yeah, I think um, I related all of them. And I think your chat window, yeah, is covering up the half of our screen here. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I forget. I, you, know, I, you know, I like to think that only I see that. but. Not so, clearly. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions before I move on? Okay. So to keep going, here are some other acceptable questions in an interview. When you use a behavior-based method, not 100% of your questions are going to be behavior-based. Behavior-based questions are most important when you're screening for those competencies. But there are other questions you're going to want to ask. Yes, no questions. Um, at Fairfax CASA, we asked our volunteers whether they were adult survivors of abuse or neglect. I say yes, no question. Um, what do you know about our organization? Or I can a question mark there. I see on my slide. 
Um, you know, always an important question. You know, how interested is this person really in your organization? What do they know? What interests you about this position? So these are still all acceptable questions to ask and, and questions you're going to want to ask. So just to clarify that, remember, don't ask hypotheticals. Hypotheticals will not give you the information that you need. So let's talk a little bit about conducting the interview, because there are a few pointers I want to share. You know, one reason that I love giving this presentation is that so few of us ever get formal training in interviewing, period, at all. We're just thrown into interviews. Um, so here are a few pointers that I've learned over the years. The first is that before you walk into the interview, and I know we're all busy, we all go a million miles an hour and are multitasking like crazy, is you want to take some time to review the application form and uh, that should say the answers, the application form and the answers on the application form. Uh, so that you know, so you have a feel for the person you're about to interview. Even if it's just 10 or 15 minutes, any additional time that you give yourself um, will really enhance the quality of the interview process. Uh, if your position is highly selective, of course, you want to set that expectation in advance. Um, I have this bullet in here because of Perfect Casa, uh, that it was a highly selective position. We wanted to let people know that if they were turned away, um, it's only because we're, we're looking for a certain particular fit in the position and it was not a reflection on them as a person. Of course, you want to remain objective, and that is by far sort of the greatest gift of behavior-based interviewing is it helps enhance your objectivity because you're not sort of reading between the lines and interpreting when someone gives you an example. You, when you go back and look at your notes, you're reading through to, to make sure that they did actually give you examples of everything you asked them for. And the examples are what you base your decision on. And, and it is totally fine to probe. Um, don't feel like you are locked into only the questions that are on the interview form. If someone gives you a partial answer or if someone gives you an answer that, that clearly leads to another question, go ahead. Keep digging. Get specifics. Ask for more examples. Use follow-up questions. That's actually a really important part of the process so that you feel fully comfortable that um, you have as much information as you can possibly get to assess the candidate. A couple more pointers. Again, be mindful of your objectivity. Don't let yourself get sidetracked by too much small talk. And also, avoid getting overly enthusiastic or overselling the position. Um, at Fairfax Casa, we had a two-step interview process. I was the person in charge of recruitment and training. So I would do a telephone interview with the candidates first, we'd go over some basic information, and then if I gave them the green light, then they would have a, a much longer interview with one of our supervisors. And what would happen, you know, I will tell you, full disclosure, what would happen with me is sometimes I would interview a candidate that I was really excited about because to me they seemed like they would be great. And so I would sort of try and sell them on the position only to have the supervisor do the longer interview and realize that they were not a qualified candidate, that there is a, there is a serious issue there. Um, so that, again, goes back to the objectivity. You really do need to hold yourself back in that respect. Um, and, uh, you know, even if it's someone that you are, that you have a, you know, a pretty quick and strong rapport with, that's not necessarily an indicator that that person is going to be a qualified volunteer for your program. So, again, you need to hold back just a little bit. You know, also the reverse is true. Sometimes if you have um, your first impression of someone is kind of negative, you don't want to let that color your assessment process either because it may turn out that that person is um, actually a pretty qualified candidate for your volunteer role or very coachable. A couple other things to watch out for, scheduling difficulties. If someone keeps canceling or rescheduling their interview with you, Past behavior is the best indicator of future behavior. That's going to be an issue when they're a volunteer. Inappropriate sharing or boundaries. You know, the person who gives you a little TMI in the interview, especially if you need um, strong interpersonal skills for the volunteer role, that's obviously something to look out for. Questioning or defense of the, of the application or interview process. If they challenge the hoops that you're asking them to jump through, Past behavior is the best indicator of future behavior. 
they're going to question your processes within your volunteer program. And then concerning body language. I realize now we're doing a lot of our interviewing over Zoom, so maybe that's, that's less of something you can pick up on. But when you are interviewing in person, you know, someone who's invading your, your physical space or is too closed off in their body language, you know, those are signals that, that you want to look out for. Uh, when it comes to assessment, we use a scoring rubric for all of our questions, and it was enormously helpful. So here's an example from Fairfax CASA um, around reliability. And, and so this is what it looked like on the interviewer's form as they were interviewing the candidate. They would ask the question. At the bottom here, they had a little reminder of what competency they were interviewing for, and then they had the one, two, three. And so uh, they would write their notes. You know, they would write down, you know, the responses that the candidate was giving them. And then after the interview, they would go back, they would look at those notes, and they would, they would score the response to the question. That is very, very useful as a check and a balance towards objectivity. So even if you find in an interview that, uh, and this happened many, many times, uh, that, you know, we would think during the interview that someone was a good candidate or not a good candidate, only to look at their scores and find out that their scores told a different story. And so it's really important to look at those scores and take them into consideration when you're making your decisions. Um, whenever possible, I realize this is not always possible. When it is possible, make candidate decisions as a team. You know, try not to let the decision rely on just one person, even if there's, there's even if there, you know, it's a dyad, even if it's two people making the decision. Um, that's helpful because it gives you something, someone to bounce your, your impressions off of, to, to uh, share the, the scoring with, to share the responses with, and to discuss whether this person should be brought into your program. Back at my program, we, we made all decisions about who to bring into the program as a team. Uh, there were five supervisors. There was me because we recruited volunteers. Um, and sometimes our executive director sat in on these decisions. It was very helpful, especially because we would have situations where someone might say, because what they're going to find is, just like now, there are some, some candidates who are automatic yeses. They're clearly a great fit. You don't have to question them. There are some people who are obviously not a good fit that you're going to turn away, and then there are going to be a bunch of people in, the, you know, kind of the middle area, the gray area. And this is when making decisions as a team is very, very helpful because they can help you suss out what's most important. You know, for example, if you're unsure about someone, you know, I can remember staff members saying, well, this guy reminds me of Tony. And, um, you know, Tony still to be very coachable, and this, this guy seems to have um, a similar work style, a similar personality, similar skills. You know, he may work out, too. Or just the reverse. You know, maybe Barry didn't work out, and, and, and this woman um, is presenting a similar profile to Mary. Uh, she doesn't, you know, her, her responses don't indicate that she's terribly coachable. You know, she's probably not a good person to bring into the program. The other advantage of making decisions as a team is that if someone doesn't work out as a volunteer, the responsibility for that decision does not fall on just one person because it was a team decision. And so, you know, obviously, as far as, as camaraderie, you know, team, you know, team morale and all of that, that is, that's important. Um, I did also promise that I would share a little bit about turning down candidates. Uh, in my program, I was the person responsible for turning away everyone. And as you know, we only accepted 30 to 35 percent of our applicants. So I was turning away a lot of candidates. Um, it was an unpleasant process for me. You know, I'm generally a pleaser. Telling someone that, that they didn't work out was, was not, um, was not pleasant in any way. I did learn over time some techniques that made it, um, you know, a much easier process. Uh, the first is, as I mentioned before, you want to prepare the candidates early in the process so that they, they have the expectation that they may be turned away because it's ultimately a question of fit and not a personal issue. You want to describe the outcome from their point of view. So, and because it was, 
it is generally true. A candidate who's not a good fit for your program is likely to be not that happy in that position and frustrated. And that's what I would uh, more often than not tell a candidate when I was turning them away. You know, I think, I think you know, you're actually not going to find this position that satisfying and you may be frustrated. You might have been frustrated. Don't give reasons, especially if the reasons have to do with their um, their emotional stability or their interpersonal skills. Um, that's just going to escalate into um, a conversation that's totally unproductive. You don't have to give reasons. Uh, it's okay to be a broken record and just say, you know, we made this decision as a team, and I'm sorry to share this news with you. You know, I know you wanted to become a volunteer in our program. You know, this is what I can tell you. And, but at the same time, be compassionate. You know, it's fine to validate that they wanted to volunteer with you and they're disappointed. And then also make sure your supervisor has your back. That was important in our program. Many people who applied to be CASA volunteers partly did so, I mean, obviously they did so because they wanted to help the children. They also loved the idea that they had a direct line to the judge, uh, that there was some status there. And when they were turned away, um, they, some of them got very upset and would, um, would end up calling the executive director to see if the decision could be overturned. So, and she always had our back, our executive director, and was often part of the decision making. But that's very important to make sure that if any potential volunteer is going to complain to someone, you know, up, up the hierarchy, that they are aware of the situation so they can back you up. Lisa, uh, we got a question in from her Gonzalez asking, can you give more examples of preparing the candidate early in the application process? Yes. Um, I would say you want to prepare them as early as the information session or, or the uh, orientation session, if that's what you call it. Uh, let them know when you are, when whatever their first introduction is to the role, you want to let them know early on that they may not be accepted as volunteers into the program. And how would you do that? Because it's selective. You just say, we just want you to know that this is a very selective program. We turn away a lot of candidates. You know, you can use the language I'm sharing now. Um, and that's because we, we have come to know through experience that uh, who is most likely to be successful in our program and who's going to be the best fit. And if you are turned away from the position, please know that it's not personal. It really is a question of fit. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we let them know that they may even be turned away in training. That was very rare, but it did happen sometimes that we would, you know, continue to assess during training and realize that someone was not going to work out as a volunteer, and then we would turn them away. Good question. Um, and also, he's saying, or she, her is saying, uh, thank you, and describe the outcome from their point of view. Any other examples would be helpful. The outcome. Um, are you asking about people who might be upset with the decision? Actually, if you could unmute and share some more information, that would be helpful. Yeah, let me find. I have to find her. There we go. Okay, her, you're unmuted. Hi there. Um, so the question was on, I'm trying to pull it up here. Um, describe the outcome from their point of view, your second bullet point that you had on there. Um, that I was referring to. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, sometimes it's purely practical reasons. You know, it might be, you know, this decision requires an extensive time commitment, and it sounds like, you know, between all of your activities and your work requirements that you really don't have the time for this position. It might be something like that. Very good, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, um, Trying to think of some other examples, but but that you know the the reasons you give will come out of the position description and the responses. Yeah, good question. Excellent, thank you. We're almost out of time, folks. Are there any others, or Lisa, do you want to concluding comments? Yeah, I'll, I think I have one concluding comment, and then I'm happy to take more questions. Um, as I said, this was one of the first trainings that I offered when I started my business, and it was one of the first blog posts that I wrote on 20hats.com, how to turn away volunteers and still have an okay day, and it's still one of the most popular blog posts on my website, I think because it's such a difficult thing to do. You know, no one really likes turning away 
potential volunteers, it, it almost seems counterintuitive. So uh, you are welcome to go to my website, 20hats.com, and take a look, take a look at the blog post. Um, and then again, I'm happy to take more questions. Are there any other questions that I can unmute folks for? Raise things was excellent. Good, good. That's the goal. That's the goal. And, you know, it is such a – you'll get a copy of the PDF to sort of help you as you develop your questions. Um, and I really do hope that you adopt this method. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you will find that it helps you. Um, I, I've trained a number of people at museums, and I've received anecdotal feedback that they find that the volunteers they're bringing now have much stronger interpersonal skills and actually are more willing to follow directions, which I think is, is interesting. They don't push back against, against uh, program policies and instructions and things like that. Getting a lot more positive feedback from you folks. Thank you so much. You're very gracious. Um, we will have all this material up on the Voices page within a couple of weeks. We're also repeating this next week, and you should have the invitation for that. Thank you especially mm -hmm. to Lisa for preparing it and presenting it so well. And I believe that's all, folks. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thanks for being here, everyone, and good luck with your interviews. <laughs> Definitely.